Good morning, everybody. It is good to see all of you here today. Uh, I am Justin. If you haven't met me, I'm the pastor here. Uh, I'm really excited because we have two visitors with us today. Well, I shouldn't say visitors. They are now permanent members. <laughs> but my daughters are here and my wife. I don't know where they are. Justin's pointing at them back there. <laughs> um, I'm happy to have all six of us here today. It's exciting. If you were wondering why God's presence was so strong during worship, it's because those two little girls came in. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're in a series. Before we get there, I have to do this uh, for, for the girls. We're excited that they're here today, but I always ask that people... We, the rule that Judah, uh, we enforce in his school in kindergarten is keep your hands to yourself. Uh, so the rule that we have with our, with our babies while they're babies is keep your hands to yourself. You can see them, but do not touch them. Uh, and I, I was practicing swatting hands away with Heather today before we got to church. So that's what happens when you, when you come to church with family uh, is everybody's going to want to touch them. Um, but I appreciate the space in advance that everybody will give them today. I always love when people thank me in advance for something uh, because I feel like it's a very, uh, like, I didn't say yes that I was going to do this yet. I didn't agree to what you're thanking me for yet, so why are you thanking me in advance? So I'm thanking everybody in advance uh, for not touching the girls. Um, anyway, time to get into the sermon I know, it's okay. I'm sorry for everybody that spoiled that was going to go touch each and every roll on their legs and on their cheeks. Um, but today we're, we're, I believe, finishing this series uh, in Reflections. We have one more week next week uh, before we finish. Um, and then we're going to be jumping into a series in Hebrews, which I'm really excited about. Uh, but today we're talking about the resurrection from a passage in John chapter 11, verse 17 to verse 20, uh, 26. And so in John chapter 11, what's happening is this is a, a story about Lazarus. And we're not going to be looking at the entire story. We're just going to be looking at one portion of, of scripture uh, in the story of Lazarus. And I'll kind of catch you up to speed of where we're going to start in verse 17. But uh, the story of Lazarus has this one incredible statement that I love that Jesus makes. So we're going to really hone in on, and it's in the middle of this conversation that Jesus has with Martha. Martha, Mary, and Jesus are a trio that have a lot of great conversations in the Gospels, uh, and this is one of them that we don't always get to look at because it's uh, part of a greater story, which is the story of how Lazarus is raised from the dead. Uh, but if you don't know about the stories, what happens is Jesus is away, and he's coming back to Town And while he's away, Lazarus, which is one of his closest friends, uh, dies. And uh, Martha and Mary uh, kind of get upset with Jesus for not being there when uh, they, they know that Jesus could have healed him, Lazarus, of his sickness. And when it, it says in the scripture, when Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was a few extra days, uh, which makes you kind of think like, Jesus, what are you doing? Why did you do that? Uh, and so people get upset at Jesus for taking so long. You could have healed him. He could have been fine. He could have still been here with us. But now he's in the grave. He's been there for several days and he is dead. He is gone. And so in verse 17, we pick up in a conversation uh, that Martha and Jesus have. And so you can read along we, uh, with me on the screen. It says this. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection 
on the last day. And here are the two verses that we're going to focus on, that we're going to be reflecting on today. In verse 25, it says, And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? As I was reading through John, this, these two verses really stuck out to me because it was another place where Jesus was making a clear proclamation of the good news. That he is the resurrection and the life. Here is Jesus in the midst of death of this friend of his that had died speaking to the siblings. And he makes this bold declaration. I am the resurrection. I am the life. What a statement that Jesus makes. But in this statement, right after that, he makes these kind of two references, one for the dead and one for the living. And we're going to start there and then kind of work our way backwards today. For the one for the one who has died but believed, Jesus says to that person, you will live on. So if you have died and you believe, you will live on. To the living, Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will never die die. You will never die. You know, one thing I always found interesting about the super rich, if you read about their lives, especially in kind of Silicon Valley or these tech giant geniuses, is that so many of them are obsessed with not dying. You know, if you look at where they spend their money and where they put their money in research, you'll find all of these different research uh, things that they are throwing their money at that have to do with immortality, living forever, whether it's, you know, freezing your body when it dies so that one day they can be brought back to life or freezing before they die or some, finding something in space or all these different things with their brain research method, methods. They will spend millions and millions of dollars researching ways to live forever. And I think it's interesting because when you amass pretty much everything that you can amass on the earth, there's still one thing in the human soul and condition that we know that we are missing. And that is that we were made to live forever. We were made to live for eternity. Before Adam and Eve sinned, we realized that we were meant to never die. And that was what we were created for. And so when Jesus reconciles us, as David read the beautiful verses in Romans 5, as he reconciles us, part of that reconciliation was breaking the curse of sin, which was death. Meaning that now Jesus, what he is proclaiming, is that those who have died are going to live for me. And if you haven't died and you believe in me, then you will live on forever. And so the, the desire of the human condition for immortality, Jesus says, is actually realized in him. Why? Because he is the resurrection. He is the life. Everyone who believes in him will live in him forever. Recently, I was watching a new documentary on Netflix uh, that came out on Bill Gates. It's a three-part documentary. Really interesting documentary. Uh, It's three hours long, and, you know, I love this kind of stuff, so... Uh, I got, we had a, I had a bag of laundry for every person in the house. That means I had six bags of laundry. Uh, and I went through the six bags of laundry while watching this documentary. Uh, but one quote that Bill Gates had really stuck out to me. And he said that the, the commentator asked Bill Gates, what, was, what is your greatest fear? I always think that's an interesting question uh, because no matter who I'm with, uh, I, when people talk about their greatest fear, I think you really get insight into what they long for, or what they desire, or what they, that really a lot of theology uh, comes into that too, whether I'm in a room of pastors and we're talking about our greatest fear, I'm just in a room with friends, or here in the room with one of the richest people who ever lived. And his answer was so interesting. He said, and I quote, I don't want my brain to stop working. That was Bill Gates's greatest fear. If you watch the movie Prometheus, a fiction movie, it's really 
when it boils down to a movie about a really rich person who wanted to live forever. See, the, the thing about death is death is scary. There's a finality to death. But death is, is really scary to those that don't know Christ. Because, you know, there's a million different things you can believe about what happens after death. Uh, some believe the finality of death is, that's it. You stop working. Uh, the only way you live on is through the memories of other, And that's why some people strive so hard to change the world or make an impact in these grand ways because they want their name to live on forever. And if you can't do that, well, then what was your life for? The, the meaning of life gets stripped away to only be given to the few significant, quote unquote, people in history. But the reason that death is scary is only scary is if we don't believe in Christ. Because death is, is not final in Christ. In fact, we know as Christians, death has been defeated. Death is only a next step into eternity, into the true glory of being with Jesus, into being his presence forever. See, the human soul was created to live on. But without Christ, it is subject to sin, which causes the penalty of death upon it. Yet for those who follow Jesus, death should not be a constant worry. It's an exciting next phase. I was looking through some scripture uh, because one of the things I find uh, about talking about eternity with Jesus um, is even for me, in our rationalistic world, you know, in the Western world where if, if it is not provable in a lab, you know, if it can't go through the scientific theory, then there's a lot of skepticism around it. And so when we talk about eternity, when we talk about living with Jesus forever, there's a lot of skepticism around it. We may talk about some of the hardest topics in Scripture. We may talk about judgment. We may talk about sin. We may talk about giving, what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Some of the hardest subjects to talk about. But really, I find what is met with the most skepticism are subjects of the supernatural or eternity. But when you look at Scripture, what you really find is a beautiful image of what happens uh, when we move on to eternity with Jesus. And so I'm going to just talk about a couple of those things and list them for us. One thing is we will enter into the joy of our Master. That is found in Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, that when we die, it is an entrance into the joy of our master, that we are walking into an eternity filled with joy. In Matthew 5, 8, it says that we shall see God. We know that we cannot see God in all of his glory because of the frailty of our human condition and the effects of sin. But when we die, we are able to see God. In 1 John 3, 2, it says we shall be like him in all of his holiness and all of his righteousness and all that he is. We will be like him. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, it says that we shall be seated with Christ in heavenly places. That we will rule with Jesus for eternity. That when we pass away from this world, we are entering into a new world where we get to be seated with Jesus for eternity. We will receive the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory. All the different crowns that scripture speaks of really is speaking of one thing. The crown that we receive is eternity in glory with Jesus Christ. And we will be removed from all disease, sadness, and the effects of sin. You know, when I talk about eternity and talk about being with Jesus forever, I realized something in my life that when I was younger and I was thinking about heaven, I thought about you know, some of the descriptors in heaven, streets paved with gold. 
and thinking about flying around, you know, with angels and uh, unlimited riches and, you know, the beauty and the lavishness. And these were the things that really got me about heaven. And I remember the first time someone talked about being in the glory of God forever and in heaven 24-7, praise and worship towards God and thinking, well, that sounds boring. <laughs> Uh, and as I got older, that kind of thought was reoccurring in my head of, you know, heaven praising Jesus for eternity. How, how can I do that? But the more I began to learn about Jesus and the more I began to fall in love with Jesus, the more that thought became beautiful in my head. That I will get to be seated with him. I will see him. I will be like him. I will receive eternity with him. I will be removed from all the things of the earth so that I can be with him 24-7, praising him before the throne. If you read through Revelation, the overarching theme of John's vision of heaven is John entering into a worship service in heaven and showing us that worship service here on earth. And it's a beautiful image of people worshiping and bowing down before the glory of God in heaven. And the rulership of Christ and God the Father over the earth. See, whoever believes in Christ, death means an ushering into the great reward, the crown. And if you think that we are the only people that have struggle with this understanding of eternity, well, we're not alone. The Sadducees were a sect of Jews in the New Testament that were around during the time of Jesus that also did not believe in the afterlife. And so every time that Jesus would talk about the resurrection, there were times where the Sadducees would start to debate with him about this because they didn't believe that there was something that happened after someone died. So when Jesus talked about the resurrection, they would say, well, what are you talking about? We don't believe in that. And they would come up with large logical arguments to fight with Jesus around this topic. And their thought was, when we die, is that not it? And that's many of the people's thoughts today. And that's why death has this scary finality to it. But the joy of faith in Christ is that the answer is no. That is not it. The one I serve on earth becomes the one I am with forever. You know, this one psalm that we've heard over and over again really puts it well when it says, better is one day in the house of the Lord than thousands elsewhere. When you have truly spent time with Jesus and you have learned about the goodness of Jesus and you have experienced and tasted of the fruit of his presence, then you realize that better is one day in the house of God than thousands elsewhere. And the reality of life is that sometimes I forget about how good it is to be in the presence of God. And the things of this world become better to me. And I start to think, man, you know what? No, I, w I really would rather do this other thing. I, I don't have time to be with Christ. I don't have time to spend with him. I don't have time because I, I want to do all these other things that fulfill me. I want to do all these other things that make me feel good, that help relax me, that rest me. And I know in my heart that when I start to think, better is one day with this than a thousand with God, then my heart has begun to wander to a world that doesn't see Jesus as the resurrection and the life, but it now becomes a world where something else is giving me life. But when Jesus says he is the resurrection, what I love about when he makes that statement is he's saying it when death's stench is most close to him. See, Jesus isn't saying this at a feast where you're celebrating a wedding or he doesn't, Say it when a new baby comes to him. He doesn't say, I am the resurrection, because that is 
an appropriate time to think about new life. But Jesus makes this declaration, I am the resurrection and I am the life, when it is most misappropriate to make this reference. When he is surrounded by death. See, if somebody were to make a statement like that, there is only one way to truly prove it. To make the thing that is dead in front of you now living. See, Lazarus, as scripture says, was dead for four days. You know, nowadays when we get to the funeral procession and the casket there, they have all the techniques so that we don't really see what four days does to a body. But what four days will do is the stench and the rot will already begin to settle in. His body was cold. The tomb stone was already rolled over. Lazarus was gone. When Jesus actually asked later on to remove the stone, Martha says, Jesus, we can't do that because there's going to be an odor. You can't open the, the, the tombstone now. It's going to smell everywhere. Let him be in peace. See, when Jesus declares that he is the resurrection, it's not when things are perfect. It is when death seems to have consumed and to have won. How often in your life has something happened and you just thought, this is it, I'm done. God can't do anything about it anymore. This is the final straw. You know, I, I, as a kid, I remember when those moments would come with my parents. <laughs> I think I went over the line this time. I'm going to get it. You know, and there are times in my walk with God where I've said, I think I've gone over the line this time. I don't think God will accept me. I, I think I have separated myself far enough from him where there isn't a bridge that can cross the gap of my salvation, for my salvation. How often have I been like Martha and said, no, Lord, don't you know? It's too late. There's already a stench in my soul. My heart has been dead for too long. There's nothing that you're going to do that's going to take away the smell. So often we prescribe the limit to God's power by natural terms. Forgetting that God does not live on natural terms, but lives on supernatural terms. That we, we act like Martha in this moment, that Jesus has come, and we say, Jesus, you can't go in there. You can't touch this. Don't you know this has been dead? For four days, this is gone. It has begun to rot. It has begun to smell, Jesus. Don't roll away that tomb. And we make compartments in our life and we say, Jesus, you can't come here. Don't enter into this space. There's death here. You don't belong here. Yet Jesus says, and his response to Martha is, don't you know who I am? This is the very place where I belong. This is the very moment that you get to see my power. See, would it really be salvation power? Would it really be miraculous? If we can fix the things in our heart that were dead on our own, would it really have been something 
if people getting up and walking after four days being dead, would that, if that was normal, would that really have been something? No, it's not. Because when Jesus comes and he works, it goes beyond our human comprehension. It goes beyond what we believe is possible. It goes beyond what we think is normal and what can happen. And we rationalize it with human forgiveness and human grace and human mercy. When Jesus says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Height, nor depth, nor power, nothing. And when Jesus looks at this dead person... He makes this declaration of, I am the resurrection. I am the life. You know, there was this guy in my old church. I'll never forget him. I remember the first night I met him. It was a Tuesday night prayer. Uh, there was maybe like 10 people at prayer that night. And he had walked in and he sat in uh, the last, one of the last two rows. And he just, he had put his head down. He was wearing all black, uh, short sleeve, black shirt, black, black pants, uh, and he cried most of the prayer meeting. And I went up and I talked to him after. And I just, I'll never forget him because I had never seen someone like this. The dude had shaved all of the hair off of his entire face, including his eyebrows. He literally had no hair on his face. Um, and he, he was just, he just kind of thanked me for saying hi to him and welcoming him and I got his name, and then he, had, he left, and he started coming on Sundays uh, after that to Sunday service. And I remember every, every Sunday coming because, it, you know, here was a guy who had a pentagram tattooed uh, on his arm. Uh, he was wearing all black. Again, it, took, it takes a while for your eyebrows to grow back. So, you know, it was, it was a stark thing. I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen kind of this face, but here he was. He, w he was coming back. And every week after week, he would come to church and he would kind of sit in the row and he would just begin to weep. And he would weep the entire service and you would be praying or you would be in the middle of worship. And there he was in the corner. He was weeping every single week and you heard him weep. It was an audible weep. He would, and, and if you looked at him, you would see his back just racking with the tears week after week after week. And as church people, sometimes you can get annoyed by this. If you're just honest, like, why does this guy got to be so emotional, you know, every week? You know, it's just a song or it's just a sermon or it's just this. Uh, but I remember as I got to know him, he began to open up about his life story. And I remember he started transitioning from weeping to dancing. And the, the life that he had come out of was, you know, it wasn't normal dancing. It was like all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're singing like, uh, I don't know, whatever songs were that we sang 10 years ago. God, I don't, I get my songs confused of like what's 20 years ago and what's 10 years ago. Uh, you know, this morning we were singing I'm Trading My Sorrows. I don't know if it was that far ago. Uh, but, it, you know, we were singing songs and here he is, you know, he would go up to the front and he would start raving you know, breakdancing <laughs> during worship. And, you know, I've been in Pentecostal church long enough to just also get even more increasingly annoyed at that. Um, because I'm just like, you know, what's going on, guy? Come on, sit down. Uh, but it was, it was really interesting because he, he would dance, then he'd go and he'd sit down and he would cry and then he would dance and then eventually he would just dance most of the service and then sometimes he'd be dancing and just start crying. And I I sat down with him, and he said, Justin, I just want to tell you my story. I was like, sure, you know, what's going on? Because uh, at this point, he was just the crazy new guy in the church. Uh, what was crazy about his life is this, this guy used to, this is going to sound crazy because it is, he used to be a self-proclaimed vampire. He was in a demonic cult, and you know, into drugs, everything that you can think of, of, of what a, a cult is and add the demonic to it. And they would do everything that vampires would do, drinking blood, seances, you know, all of these crazy, crazy, crazy things. Uh, and that's why he didn't have any hair on his face, because part of some rituals that they would do would be shaving all of the hair from their face and their body. Uh, and... 
what had happened was that Tuesday night, that first night that he had come, he had just sensed God calling him into the church. And he had walked in and he had sat down in prayer and he sensed the love of God that night, really for the first time. And he cried that entire night because he, he knew his sin. He knew the life that he lived, the, the demonic, cult, demon, devil, worshiping life that he was living and hated God hated the church, hated Christians, yet here he was sitting in the back of a church crying overwhelmed by the love of God and then coming Sunday after Sunday overwhelmed by the love of the people in the church and the love of God that he felt in the presence of that room. And he would weep every week and he would dance every week because God freed him from it all. And he would come and he'd say, Josh, you just won't believe the, the cravings that I don't have anymore, the things that I don't need to do anymore. You don't understand the life that I would live. And sometimes you would tell me something, and I'd be like, bro, stop telling me this. This is crazy. You know, it, being a pastor, you, hear, you know, almost no confession at this point will phase me. You know, I have literally heard it all. But some of the things this guy would tell me, I'm just like, you got to stop. <laughs> stop telling me about it because this, this is wild. Like there is a whole universe going on that I don't know that exists about this. But this dude experienced God's love and every week he was experiencing it over and over. And the weight of who he was and the, the death that literally he would say, Justin, I was dead. Death, it was, it was part of who I was. I celebrated death. I prayed to death. Death was, was what I wanted. It was part of the things that we worshipped. It was death. And, and here he was, now made alive to the righteousness of God. And one of my favorite stories that he had is he had been coming to church for a while. And uh, so single people, I wouldn't recommend this totally. I, I think God had a special relationship with him. Uh, but he was in the train station one day, and he said, God, I need a wife. <laughs> he said, the next woman that comes and talks to me and gives me a hug, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> I promise you, 10 seconds later, this girl comes and says, uh, she just says, God loves you, and gives him a hug. They got married. <laughs> and if you, ever, if, if you ever met him and then you met her, you realize this is the perfect couple. Like, there was no one in the world that could have been better for this guy than this woman. And they're still married today. It's been years. Uh, he had since, he moved to another state because he really just, New York had so much of that lifestyle and that world to him. He just felt like God was calling him out. But the, the question that really comes to mind after I think of him, this guy, and I, I used to ponder it often when I would hear him crying in the back or I'd see him dancing in the front, is, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus life? Is he truly the resurrection? Do I really believe this? You know, Jesus ends that question with Martha. He says, do you believe this? Week after week, as I would see this man weep and dance and weep and dance and just be so grateful. So I've never met somebody that was so grateful and so thankful for what God has done. That question would haunt me. Do I really believe this? Is that psalm true? Better is one day in the house of God than thousands elsewhere. Jesus says, I am life itself. When he spoke into the dust and breathed, the first man and woman was created. He says here, all who die yet believe will never die. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The call of Jesus is constant and is the same. Believe in me. 
See, the thing is, next time you feel dead, you could have felt it for a long time. You could be telling Jesus at this very moment, this is too far gone for you. This is too smelly for you. This, this, this is a stone that is too heavy for you to roll away. You may feel like all hope is lost. Remember the powerful words of Jesus. That with a cold and smelly body on the other side of that tombstone, he says this, I am the resurrection. And then he says when he prays and he says, Lazarus, come forth. He says, this is for their belief, but not for mine. And speaks life into that body. And he comes and he walks. See, Ephesians 1 says that the same power that resurrected Jesus from the dead is working in us. If that power can literally bring a dead person to life, how much more can it conquer just the dead areas of my heart? See, we cannot keep walking away from here Sunday after Sunday, prayer meeting after prayer meeting, Bible study after Bible study, not believing in what Christ said about himself. That he is the resurrection. He is the life. He is the only way to the Father, the only way to eternal life, that anything outside of him is death. That the only way to fulfill the human condition of what we were born for, what we were created for, the only way to truly be what we have been made for is what? To find it in Christ. We cannot leave here Sunday after Sunday wondering if I spend time with him, will it be better than what I do during the week? We can't keep wrestling with that question. At some point, Jesus is going to ask, just like he did Martha, do you believe? And at some point, we have to say, yes, Jesus, I believe. And as we read last week, our belief leads to abiding, and our abiding leads to truth, and that truth leads to freedom. At some point, we have to stop walking away from Scripture. We have to stop walking away from church, stop walking away from prayer, and wondering, will that work? And at some point, we have to say, Jesus, I believe in you, and I believe in what you have done, and I believe the words that you have said, that you are the resurrection, that you are the life. And if I believe in you, I will have eternal life. I will be seated with you in heavenly places. I will see your glory. I will be like you in your death and in your resurrection. I will be apart from this world of disease, sadness, depression, and I will be with you in joy of my my master in glory forever and ever. Church, will we believe? Will we believe what Jesus said over and over again? In every conversation that he had, he pointed to eternity. And he asked this question over and over again. Do you believe? Do you believe? And he made this statement about who he was. But one of the most clear statements, one of the most powerful, I believe, is when he truly reveals himself as the resurrection, as life itself, that any partness from him, any way that we walk away from him, we are walking away from life, and we are walking into death, we are walking into destruction. Can you stand with me and pray?